Welcome to the Mike on Much podcast. I'm here with my friend and trusty producer, Max Kerman. Yo, yo, yo. Also here with our pop culture aficionado, Shane Cunningham. Yo, yo, yo. And I am your host, Mike Veerman. Max, what's going on today? Guys, f- that. Breaking news. What's that? Guess who just broke up? Who? Nick and Vanessa. Oh! Yeah, come on, really? Are you serious? Yeah. That's awesome. See? <laughs> I'm not, okay, so yeah. for our listeners, right before we recorded, like 10 minutes ago, Shane comes up to my desk and he says, <laughs> hey, don't look at your phone. And I'm like, whoa, that's like frightening. He's like, no, no, just don't look at Instagram. I go, okay. He goes, something <laughs> crazy just happened. I go, okay. So I've been waiting in anticipation. That's the big news. Well, yeah, because pod fans were contacting my uh, personal Instagram. They're messaging me. They're like, <laughs> oh, you were right. All this about the breakup. And I'm like, oh, sweet. <laughs> and then I emailed Dan Crothers or Webmaster Dan, as we call him. I'm like, don't tell Mike and Max this. Don't put anything on socials. And then he's just like, I really don't care about this. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, this is about the pod. You should care. And then all of a sudden, people started tagging at Mike on Much, oh, the, wow. the news. So I was telling you guys not to check the phone. But I knew an engaged woman doesn't look at me like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> that, was, that was my uh, big, exciting news. Whoa. So do you feel somewhat vindicated in predicting that they were? Well, I was feeling a little <laughs> foolish. From the story, like, I'm like, oh, you know, uh, delusions of grandeur, all that stuff that I'm always accused of, thinking that Vanessa was actually, like, eyeing me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Turns out she was. <laughs> so you're saying she was on the prowl in Montreal. You were there, Mike. What do you think? It seems like the evidence uh, is in your favor. You were very good at making, like, definitive statements about things. <laughs> and, you're, like, with absolute certainty, you do it all the time. Mm-hmm. And you're right. But you're right a lot of the time. Yeah. Yeah. That's the why I make those statements. Because yeah. if I don't say them, I'm like, I was thinking that. I should have said it. Yeah. Now no one's going to believe me. Especially when it comes to relationship stuff. Mm-hmm. It's like you also say whenever a girl is breaking up with a guy, she has a guy ready to go. That's another one of your th- Oh, yeah. It's like I have a very low IQ, but a pretty <laughs> high EQ. Emotional intelligence? Quotient, yeah. Is that what the word is? Quotient? Is that the know. Q is in yeah. IQ? Yeah. Max and I both did not know that, yeah. meaning that we would score low on any sort of <laughs> quotient but, test. But I want you guys to talk about the, the big thing that we're actually here to talk about. Actually, before we get to that, have you guys ever taken an IQ test? I have not. I like to... Uh, I have suspicions about what I'd score, and I don't want to be confirmed. I think you'd sc- score really high, actually. Oh, Max. Yeah, no, it's true. Kind. You're, uh, you are you seem to know a lot about stuff. Actually, though, your geography is bad. They don't test for that, do they? I certainly hope not. Have you ever taken an IQ test? I do well on everything except for spatial awareness. For our listeners, he's sitting on top of Max right now. <laughs> <laughs> is that your cell phone? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like I, I never know where I am, and I, I've got a really... Uh, Poor recall. And Mike's amazing at recall. Like yeah. Mike remembers literally everything. So I think Mike's like genius in that regard. How, you how do, do you math? do? I'd probably oh, do I'm terrible. horrible at math. Yeah. Very dumb dumb. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. I can't remember anything. Like uh, studying any also like studying for uh like biology or any of those subjects where you have to like remember a lot of stuff. Can't I think it. you're the school uh, smartiest. No, like, no, no, no. I was pretty, I was very average. You went to university though. Yeah, that doesn't mean anything. I'm though. in awe of people who went to university. The only difference between someone who went to university and someone who didn't go to university is their parents going, you know, you're going to university. Mm-hmm. That's literally the only difference. Yeah. And so your parents weren't like, you're going to university from the they age of like, six. They were like, Shane, can you graduate high school? And <laughs> I said, no, actually, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what I'm saying. I don't think our like, listeners know that about yeah. you. Yeah. No, I was doing big things, you know. But uh, yeah, the reason why we're potting today is this is the the release day of Taylor Swift's new new single. That's correct. And uh, I'll be honest with you, I was we had a gig last night in Toronto. It was a charity gig, and uh, we were the gig finished at like eleven fifteen, and then at twelve o'clock, everybody was on their phone pulling up the new Taylor Swift single because this has been a bit of a countdown this week. And um, <laughs> <laughs> what? It's just Mike and I had no idea this was happening. <laughs> <We don't care. laughs> it's been a countdown. I've been waiting with bated breath. No, but you are right. Like as far as pop culture goes, it has been a big thing online. Well, and we got a message at one oh seven a.m. Yeah. Emergency pod tomorrow morning, and I woke up to that. I was like, "Holy shit, what happened?" <laughs> You're like Taylor Swift. I Google it. I thought she died or something. <laughs> I thought something huge happened. Yeah. And then I'm like, all I see is that a single was released. <laughs> so I want to know your thoughts. Uh, Mike, you, I want to start with you. What are, your, what are your initial thoughts on the Taylor Swift song? For me, it feels super uh, on brand in the sense that she's sort of complaining about like a, an interaction. I mean, I guess this time with a celebrity as, as opposed to a former lover. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's, I think people are thinking she's talking about Kanye West and yeah. Kim and maybe a little Katy Perry. It's hard to say exactly. So so thematically, it, it's, it sticks with Taylor's sort of penchant for airing out her dirty laundry or cathartically writing about experiences in her life and, and put them in the public form. Shane? Uh, well, I don't like 
to critique people too harshly because, you know, I always try to take risks and do different things comedically or whatever, like the, you know, the red carpet Jim Carrey stuff. And people always hate it. Yeah. Any Anytime I try something, it's like, oh, like I, I come off bad kind of. But I will say she took a risk and I don't think it paid off. It's it's very lame. It, it, <laughs> it, it, it's extremely lame. And I appreciate the risk, but it's like when Garth Brooks was Chris Gaines. Uh-huh. You know a very I mean? modern reference for all of our younger <laughs> listeners. <laughs> but but it's it's a reference I can pull from of a horrible failure of someone trying to rebrand themselves. He played SNL as Chris Gaines. Crazy move. And the part in the song where she's like, hello, is Taylor there? Whoopsie, she's dead. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, that's embarrassing. <laughs> because you can't change who you are. Like, you can't pretend to be cool. Yeah. I, I've tried. You know, you, you smoke cigarettes for a week or something, <laughs> and you're still watching Bachelor in Paradise the next week. Get tattoos right? all over your arm. Exactly. But I'm, I'll never be cool. You know, so you can't pretend sure. for more than an hour. Uh-huh. So that's what's lame about it. She's trying to act like she can... The old Taylor's dead. The old Taylor is not dead. The old Taylor's pretending she's cool now. Yeah. All right. Well, Max, you convened this emergency pod. So what are your thoughts? You're a big Taste With fan. You're a huge fan. Yeah, I am. And um, I was very excited about this song because she has kind of an immaculate record. She's on her fifth record now. And each album, she has produced like massive hits that aren't just big because she's like a big star. They're big because they're great songs. They're great songs. Yeah. She's wait, a golden goose. She's a golden goose. And like when she came out with her last record in 1989, the first single was Shake It Off. And I remember driving, I was driving up Avenue Road. I still remember where I was when I listened to it. And I was like, this is pop bliss. This is a song that every cover band is going to play for the next 40 years. Yeah. And which has been the case. Like yeah, the new Hey Ya. Yeah, exactly. And um, so there's a lot of pressure in that because as you say- She like, had seven hit singles off that last I time. know, it's crazy. Yeah. And she and off the previous one and off the previous one before that. She's actually, she's an incredible songwriter. So that's why as a songwriter and as an artist who's also trying to evolve, I was like, where is she going to go next? And when I saw the snake uh, video thing happening, I was like, oh, are you going to- are you going to go down that road, which is like, you know, Kanye, you're a snake or Kim, you're a snake. So I was I was like hoping, but she's already, as you say, she's good at uh, airing her dirty laundry, but she's always sort of done it in a playful way or sort of like in a joyful way where you still get that sort of like sense of like pop ecstasy, like uh, Blank Space or even Mean. Do you remember that song, Mean? Yeah, Why like, Gotta Be So Mean? Yeah, and so she's always really good at that. So I was like, I, re- I wonder if she's going to go down sort of this a little more like cynical, dark root. And on the song, she has. It's it's like not as joyful. It doesn't have a big soaring chorus that I was hoping for. Sounds like for. a Fergie song a lot. Well, there's a lot of people saying it sounds like a Gwen Stefani mm-hmm. song. And so I was like, okay. When I first listened, I was like, I don't like it. Actually, my friend Matt Frookman, Book Club Maddie, as our Summer Arkells fans might know him as, called me and was so furious about it. He was, I, I could like read you actually some of the text messages. Uh, <laughs> hold on. Let's like, read he was, he was, uh, why did Taylor Swift do this? She has actual talent. This is horrible. It's like a bad Britney song from 03. Like who thought this was a good idea? And then I called him and he, and he went on to rant for about 10 minutes, like screaming at the top of his lungs on his phone. It was funny. But then I was starting to think, I was like, okay, where is this song going to live? Because obviously my idea going into this song was like, this is going to be another big feel good, like Mm -hmm. arena rocker. But then uh, I was with our manager, Ashley, and and she lives right by the village. And she was like, honestly, there's probably like every gay nightclub right now is probably pumping this song loud and people are going nuts for it. Mm -hmm. And then I put, and then I put myself into like the you club. went to a gay club? Yeah, yeah. I went. No, no. I had to see for myself. <laughs> no, no. But then I put myself in like the club world for a second. I was like, oh, this. And I was like, the, like the the smoky like lights. And yeah, the, you and your hockey bros. Yeah, me and my hockey bros. Dancing like King in the West. <laughs> That's you know, honestly. And uh, and then I, well, then I thought of all the Champagne Boys in Miami, and we're going to Miami. That's true. In a week, and there's no doubt that song is going to be played in the club, and we're all probably going to go nuts for it. I think. Well, okay, it could be like um, remember Sexy Back came out, Justin Timberlake. Yeah. And everyone hated, hated that, that fucking song. And then, like, I hated that song. And then it got in my brain. It, like, permeated in there. And then a week later, I was obsessed with it. That's what I'm saying is I think. And then, I, and then we listened to it probably, like, five times. We went back to Ash's house and we just, like, put it on repeat. I was like, okay, I can kind of see. And the pre-chorus is actually massive. The pre-chorus actually has, like, a lot of, like, melodic juice to it. And then Ashley was kind of going down the internet rabbit hole. And she said the three tweets that Taylor Swift has liked – there's one for promo for um, uh, the first uh, college football game of the season, Alabama versus Florida, which in middle America, Trump's America, is you know the biggest attraction. 
Uh, two, it's, it's, it's in a promo for uh, some Shonda Rhimes show, some network show on ABC. And she's also going to be debuting the music video on the MTV Video Awards. So she has all these looks that are really big. It's like, and as you say, it's going to permeate the culture very quickly. And the last thing I'll say is that when you think about where a song lives, and I thought about this one with Arkells, just, just from like, oh my God, this is like knocking at the door in a sports montage or whatever. And you're like, oh, that's, that's really, it, it kind of gives the song a new meaning and new life. There are so many like murder mystery shows out there, like 13 Reasons Why, or just like dramas on, on Netflix and, uh, and movies that that song is going to be perfect for. Can you imagine? That song is going to be in every trailer. Sure. Right? Like lyrically, it's just like kind of perfect for it. So it didn't check off the initial box of like this is like a powerful triumphant song that they might play at the Olympics or something like that. But it did check off all those other boxes, mm-hmm. which, which, which then you go, okay, I, I see a path for this song. And maybe if she had like a similar song that was a, a bona fide hit similar to her last album, people would be criticizing that. Yeah. Saying, oh, like she's just doing the same. More of the same. The other thing I was thinking about was uh, the guy who produced the song is a guy who I'm always jealous of, Jack Antonoff. Oh, yeah. Did you know that? I didn't know he produced it. I know they're tight, though. He he also did Out of of the Woods. Out of the Woods? Yeah, Out of the Woods. Yeah. Yeah. Now, okay. I had lunch with that guy once. What? Yeah, man. Jack Antonoff? Yeah, he was in the band Fun. Yeah. And uh, we shot a promo in Montreal with him and... uh, had lunch with him. What was he, he like? He used to date Scarlett Johansson. I know. He's dating Lena Dunham. Yeah. He was a nice guy. All right. So Taylor Swift, play or nay? Play. Uh, indifferent. <laughs> I say nay for now, but only time will tell. Yeah. The, and the other thing I'll say is I'm just excited for the rollout because you know she has many tricks up her sleeve for like the next three months because the record doesn't come out until November 10th. And the other thing is that the theorizing going around these, this song and the record rollout is kind of incredible. Like, for instance, you know, the tilted stage thing. That's a Kanye West Kanye reference. shot, yeah. Uh, also, I didn't know this, but somebody texted this to me this morning. Apparently, November 10th, the, the day of a release, is the 10-year anniversary of Kanye West's mother passing. And, like, I was like, that has to be a coincidence. But but apparently, people say Taylor is so calculated. That, that could be a thing. That would be very cold. Do you know how she died, by the way? It was, like, uh, plastic surgery or something? Yeah, she was getting breast augmentation. Oh, well. I never actually knew what the surgery was. Is that true? <laughs> yes. It's very sad. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that album's out November 10th. Max is digging the song. Shane's not having it. Check it out. Let us know what you think. We're going to have Ann T. Donahue on the show. I was texting her this morning, and she has a lot of thoughts on this. Would love to get Ann's thoughts yeah. on all of this. Yeah. Okay. But speaking of female performers, today on the show, we have Grace Mitchell, as well as your old friend, River Tiber. That's right. Tommy. That's right. We did these interviews uh, at Oshiaga, uh, Shane and I. Um, do you remember these, Shaney boy? Yeah, I said some stuff in this one. That's right. So Grace was interesting because she had said some things about Wonder Woman um, and not thinking that it was sort of the feminist empowering movie that everyone had been championing it as. And I thought she was cool. I mean, she's very young. She's 19. And that seems to be sort of like one of the things that she finds, I guess, frustrating is that people either are dismissive or they expect her to be underwhelming. And then they're like, oh, you're good. Like she, she's so tied to her age that she thinks that it should sort of be a non-issue. Huh. And so we talk about that and sort of where she's coming from um, in that regard. And then we had River on. And, and uh, for listeners of the pod who uh, listened to the Nelly Furtado interview, he has mentioned there, and I bring up a story about Tommy, because he produced the first ever Max Kerman uh, solo record. The first and only Max Kerman uh, solo some Max record. stories. Did he? We yeah. asked about you. I haven't listened to this yet, so I'm kind of excited. Yeah, he, he, might, uh, he may or may not have some old recordings of you. <laughs> He's got to burn those things, man. He's going to put them out, bro. Yeah, and when I say the Max Kerman solo record, it was uh, the first time I ever recorded anything, and I was 15 years old. <laughs> so pretty cool, though, the fact that, you know, this guy, River Tiber, goes on to do great things, working with Nelly Furtado. Drake has used his music, his beats, and you were working with them back when you guys were teenagers. Yeah, before Drake ever heard of him. Just a couple Toronto kids yeah. making magic. So something like that. You guys want to get to the interviews? Let's do Let's it. Do it. How are you? Hello. You seem like you're a little trepidatious. You're kind of super fucking tired, crazy you just, tired. You just came off stage. Yeah. How was it? It was really good. Um, we just came from Chicago, no, Boston, and we were we were in the van for like five hours. We haven't gotten any sleep. It's intense. <laughs> so we're tired. You just rolled into town and got on stage. Yeah. It's your birthday tomorrow. It is. Early happy birthday from the both of us. 
Thank you. The big two zero. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yes. Awesome. It's a landmark it. birthday. It is. Yeah, I'm excited. It's not gonna be so creepy now that I'm not 19 that I'm dating like a 30 year old. <laughs> it's, not gonna be, it's not gonna be so bad anymore. Well, I guess my question would be about birthdays and aging in general. Some people have hang-ups about getting older. Some people like getting older. Where do you fall on that spectrum? I like getting older. I think that um, I get stigmatized a lot as being um, like like a very young. Well, I'm I am a very young artist, and so people like to assume that my music is going to be, I think, underwhelming, and. Um, that is challenging to try and combat because I want to be kind of always impressing people and challenging them. And when they, you know, it's not always a compliment when someone says like, oh my God, you're so good for being 19. You know what I mean? Like they I want to be good. They always quantify it. Yeah. Yeah. I want to be good because I'm fucking good, you know? So. So the idea that getting older, maybe uh, people won't have preconceived notions. Yeah, exactly. I, I hope that that will change the older that I get. In some ways though, it's kind of like, an opportunity to fucking blow people away. Yeah. You know, because if you go in and they don't expect the best, it's kind of like a nice little edge to have. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's it's going to be a, a bummer in the future when it, <laughs> when everything that I do isn't going to be as exciting anymore. When you're for, underwhelming. For my age, yeah. yeah it's exactly. funny. It's like a two way two way street. Um, you grew up in Portland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What'd your parents do, or what do they do? My they uh, my dad did something called uh, he was a fundraising coach, which means that he was kind of raising money for high school sports teams to get like equipment that they needed. And my mom just was a stay at home mom. Cool. So that's like a job. So he would like find ways to raise the money for these schools. Or yeah. Whatever? Yeah. So like if 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 like your football team needed new helmets, he would find ways to make money so that you can have new helmets. Right. Yeah. Uh, are they artistic people? Yeah, they're pretty artistic. Um, my Mom is uh, is good at songwriting, and I think that she probably was the segue into me doing a lot of creative writing and songwriting. Interesting. Do you guys ever co-write together? No. <laughs> you do your own thing, and she does hers. Does she yeah. ever present you songs like, "Hey, maybe try this one out"? She does, but we got boundaries. We got boundaries <laughs> about that. So, when you decided to go into this thing, and I mean, obviously, like you said, part of your narrative is how young you are. Were they supportive? Like. Did they see this as a viable career? Because it's such a hard industry to make yeah. it in. No, they were super supportive. I think that they both, um, from a young age, wanted me to pursue whatever what felt passionate. And if I, you know, because a lot of kids I don't feel like have passions or they have many passions, they don't really know what to pursue. And I was pretty dead set on doing music. And so they were supportive of it. You had a narrow focus from the start? Yeah, yeah. I was like, I think, I think I'm good at this. And I didn't feel like I was really good at anything else. So music felt natural and organic. Right. Do you, I mean, are you naturally sort of an ambitious person? Like, you know, because some people get into music because they're f***ing around. It's like they just like enjoy creating. And then other people have like a sort of an eye on the prize. Where do you fall on that spectrum? I, I, w I think that I'm, I would say, and I'm, I didn't quite catch that question. I'm sorry. It's like raining so loud. People, it's the listeners loud, don't yes. know that it's raining so <laughs> loudly here at Oshiaga. But anyway, what were you saying? Basically, some people get into music and they're just, yeah. you know, they like to create. Ambitious. And, yeah. And do you, are you someone that had sort of the eye on the prize? Like, I'm going to make a career in music and this is how I'm going to do it. Yeah. 100%. I think that from the beginning, I've been like, okay, even if at some point I want to pursue some other artistic um, form of creativity, I'm going to be able to do it through the catalyst of music. So if I just kind of continue to pursue it and give it my all, then it's going to be the propeller for whatever I want to do in the future artistically. So, um, yeah, I would say I'm pretty ambitious about my career. Right. I guess when you see success sort of pretty early on, like, I guess, how do you go from creating in your home to then playing at a festival like Oshiega? Um, like, I mean, it's a long process. I was doing, like, small coffee shop gigs and, like, um, open mics and stuff, and then I just kind of spiraled. One thing led to another, and then I was coming down to L.A. to record. So, but what's that step? Does someone see you in the coffee shop, or do you just head no, to L.A.? Yeah, no, I was, um, I was, it's a very, very complex story, but basically I was scouted in an airport for modeling, and uh, I was like 13, and they were like, do you have any talents? And I was like, I like to do songwriting, and I do a lot of performing in my small town. And they're like, okay, well, show us. And then they set me up with... Uh, a model agent who wanted to cross over to music management and he had a couple contacts in LA and then I met who was my now current manager Kevin Held uh, through this old hookup and it has kind of all 
gone from there. So, like, I would say probably the initial moment was being scouted in an airport for modeling. And also, I happened to be neighbors with this guy named Richard Swift. Okay. Who is this kind of, like, pretty um, underground, uh, like, indie influencer guy. And he was just one of my neighbors. So, it was, like, kind That's of... That's fortuitous. Yeah, it was... That was a good win <laughs> score. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you use your social media to champion causes such as like women's or LGBTQ rights is speaking out something that sort of comes natural to you. And I guess like, was there a case of like, I have a platform and I want to use it now. Have you ever yeah. thought, eh, maybe I won't say something? No, I think that I am really vocal. I have a lot of opinions that are like either fully formed or like continuing to form in my adult life. So I just want to kind of share them and get feedback from people. I really like when people correct me or teach me new things, especially online when I can like, like shout something into the void and then get a bunch of people commenting back being like, this is what you should say. This is how we feel. And it is this wonderful collective to figure out like more and more about how I feel about um, human rights and like activism and feminism and the LGBTQ community. It's a, I love the internet. Yeah. And it seems like you don't, you don't mind throwing out like a half-baked thought because some people will be like, okay, this is what I want to say. They'll curate it. They'll figure it out. You're like, fuck it, I'll throw it no, out. No, I'll throw it out there. I also like to incorporate comedy into a lot of my opinions about feminism and activism um, because I think that there's a lot of... there's While it's really important to be politically correct and sensitive and all-inclusive when you're speaking about a community, I think it's also um, fun to be like have like some sort of self-awareness regarding it in like a comical sense because it makes everything lighter you know what i mean do you so ever I'll get just... worried that someone's gonna take the joke the wrong way and you're yeah gonna... but i don't care right i don't give a shit if they're gonna be sensitive like i i already like i have so much um continuity through all my interviews to prove that i want to be like i am a feminist mm -hmm. like i i believe all these um, values regarding human rights and making sure that everyone is treated equally that I think that sometimes I can just say some some shit in the name of comedy and right. people will get offended but you know what people get offended mm -hmm. you know what I mean well by the na by their very nature these issues are sensitive so yeah. people tend to be sensitive about these issues yeah, yeah, but you feel like your track record is infallible when it comes to your intentions yeah I would say that no one could look at Grace Mitchell the person and be like oh she's she's insensitive or she's, you know, being cruel because I, I, it's not coming from a place of cruelty. It's kind of one of my favorite comedians is Amy Schumer. Yep. I love how she takes feminism and gives it a really dark, funny twist. It's like super intellectual, dark comedy. And I love that shit. It's hilarious to me. Yeah. Did you like her leather special? Yeah, I did. Yeah. I thought, oh, it's so funny. I love when she talks about sex. I talk about sex a lot. And so it's it's fun to see how she takes the female gaze of sex and like turns it around and flips it. It's good. Speaking of feminism, you tweeted about Wonder Woman. Uh, yeah, yeah, which, yeah. you know, obviously uh, a lot of people are yeah. treating it yeah, as like, a major movie, film. Terrible movie. I hate it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't movie. like it either, actually. It's, yeah, it was no, weird it's, and it's not a popular opinion. Nah, it's a bad movie. Mm -hmm. It's a bad movie. I don't, yeah, I have a lot of, I, I see a lot of movies and I form strong, strong opinions like the second that they start. Um, didn't like One Woman. Um, Why I, wasn't it a feminist uh, film, though? It wasn't opinion? a feminist film for a lot of reasons. Firstly, the biggest point that actually someone else pointed out to me is that she is literally an object to her purpose in the entire movie is to be a tool for other gods to use like this is the antithesis of feminism and that is the objective the the entire plot right is that she's a tool so just to begin there that was kind of frustrating to see i think that there was a lot of sexualization a lot of um stereotyping uh hot a uh, foreign girl who is unassumingly intellectual but also needs help from man to succeed. There's, it's like a lot of classic plot lines regarding like feminism, um, excuse me, um, the antithesis of feminism, really. Sure. If she wasn't like classically beautiful, let's say, let's say she had like a unibrow or whatever. Oh, do you I, don't think think that would... I don't think it's about beauty necessarily. Mm -hmm. I think, that, I think that, that beautiful women can be hyper, hyper feminist, like uh, Candace Swanepoel or like, um, for example, like Emma Stone. 
Um, and yeah. it's, it's not necessarily about like traditional beauty. I think what was happening a lot in that film in particular, though, was this uh, objectification yeah. of foreign women, right. which is a huge thing in our culture in particular. Do you think that like a film like that, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, it's a great film to have for young girls to like look up to a strong model. Do you think it's better to have a film like that that maybe they can have a model? Or do you think it does more damage because of these sort of underlining things that maybe people don't see on its face? Yeah, I think there's a lot of subconscious things in that movie that are still um, perforating minds of young people. I think a really fantastic feminist film is Frozen, actually. Sure. I think that that was, for kids, I think that's a fantastic film. Um, Did you see Zootopia? I think Zootopia is an amazing I film. I love that movie. All about, like, like uh, standing against, like, um, basically the man. Yeah. And, and, like, blatantly talking about racism, which is incredible. I yeah. love all of the, like, Pixar Disney films coming out lately. They're so f***ing good. They're smart. Yeah, smart. And they're funny. Um, what's the best movie you saw this year, 2017? Um, I can't stop thinking about Dunkirk. Oh, interesting. Um, I love that movie. It was the first movie that I've ever seen that made me feel, I mean, it obviously didn't take place in America, but it made me feel really patriotic for some reason. And um, I thought it was an incredibly beautiful film. I saw it at the Arclight in Hollywood in 70 millimeter. Okay. Wow. So it was a really, it was like an experience. It's so intense. Eh? It's like unrelenting. Like a, yeah, yeah, it's so intense. The score is incredible. There's such minimal dialogue. Mm -hmm. Crazy. I really also love uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Oh, that's yeah. great. Yeah. That guy knows how to make movies. James yeah. Gunn. Both of those films are really good. A lot of funny feminist undertones in Guardians of the Galaxy, actually, if you really take it apart. I mm -hmm. like that movie a lot. Did you see Get Out? I didn't see Get Out because I don't watch horror movies. Oh, okay. that's yeah. just like your rule? That's, uh, no, no, no. That's, I was my wife is like that. very tempted to see Get Out when it first came out. But I, yeah, again, I don't watch horror movies. so It's more of a thriller type comedy. Yeah. The best movie I, I think you'd like it. I'm, see it. Yeah, I think I should <laughs> see it. I think it's a necessary one to see. So eventually I will. I guess we'll end on a, a cover question. Get back to the music. So you've covered Hall & Oates. You've covered Post Malone. Yeah. Uh, we had Post Malone on the podcast. Oh, word. I love that guy. Yeah, it was his wedding song. Yeah, the uh, White Iverson was my like first dance song. Yeah. So he oh. got... Yeah. <laughs> my wife and I both grew up playing basketball and stuff, and Iverson was our favorite That's player. That's fantastic. Yeah. I love that. Wow, cool. So he had Post uh, sign his his wife's wedding photo. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That yeah. is the fun... I love that story. Wow. <laughs> Congrats. Yeah, he's... What a character. That guy's a cartoon. Mm -hmm. I love him. I love him. him. Yeah. So anyway, what bands or songs, I guess, are on the list uh, for your next cover? Um, I am going to be doing a cover, actually, that's going to be coming out soon, of Gary Clark Jr.'s Bright Lights. Okay. It's about New York City. So you can look forward to that. It's a fun cover. You're recording it? Like, not yeah, just live? currently. Gonna, no, you're it's happening it out. right now. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I don't even feel like... I don't know if I was supposed to share that, but I don't, I'm not scared. I don't care. Fuck it. You do what you want. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for your time. Thank you guys we very really much. We really appreciate it. Uh, we're just going to roll. We'll just jump right into this thing. How you doing, man? Good. How are you? Good. Good. I think there's a connection here. So you know Max from Arkells. I do, yeah. He he went to high school with my sister. Yeah. In uh, in Toronto. And I, um, I mean, I recorded like some of his like early demo stuff in our basement when I was like 12 years old. Those are like some of the first records that I ever produced technically. But it was really on like a... I don't know. It, it was... I, I didn't even know what production was or anything else like that. It just was... You know, present play, turning the knobs and stuff. You so. were the guy with the gear, though. Yeah, yeah. That Max I, needed to, to yeah, get his exactly. shit down. I had like a little. It was like a Fostex. Oh like yeah. Eight track recorder or something. It was really uh, simple and yeah. Wow. I don't know. It was awesome. What was uh, Maxi Boy like back then? Um, I mean, as far as I can tell, you know, same guy. Cocky as hell. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was killing it. <laughs> yeah, that's. Like, do you still have those tracks? Yeah, they're somewhere. That's. I hilarious. gotta find them. Yeah, I mean. Uh, That'd be pretty funny. Yeah, to unearth love those, to hear that. Know? That's such a like such a random connection that probably nobody could have guessed. You know? Yeah, what I mean? so random. Like, well, it was funny because we we interviewed uh, Nelly Furtado. She was on the show. Yeah, yeah. And she'd mentioned that you guys were working together. Yeah, And then Max awesome. was like, "Holy shit!" He's like, "He like my first recordings yeah, with yeah. him." Yeah, yeah. That's hilarious. Uh, yeah. Um. So you know, shout out Nelly Furtado. Geez. Shout out Nelly. She's she's a legend, and she's like one of the nicest people I've ever met, and she's just. Amazing, genuine and kind. Yeah, which just, for somebody that successful, no, it's it's mind blowing. It's rare. Like she's, she's a wonderful person. Yeah. yeah, how'd that come about? That collaboration. Um, 
actually just like Twitter, I think like that's when we first talked, you know, like I, th I think that maybe she heard some of my music or something. And then we just, we just were talking and uh, we got to meet um, when I was in LA and uh, yeah, we just, we just really hit it off. She, so like, she slid into awesome. your DMs or? <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, the, <laughs> he's like, no, no, it was, cut it, bro. <laughs> it was, it was definitely, it was definitely on the the public side of Twitter. <laughs> right, right. I see. That's hilarious. Oh. I love how like Canadians too. It's like always the things like, oh, well, we ended up like meeting up in LA. It's like people can be in the same city, but then you finally meet up like down in like another hub. I know. Yeah, it's funny like that, and it's always LA too. Like I, I, every time I go there, I see like just Toronto people. I only yeah. hang out with Toronto people. Do you still like do extended stays, or do you just kind of like go down there for business and that? For the most part, that's what I've done, but um, I really want to go down there this winter and like stay there for a few months because, you know, I mean, it's, it's the best. It's yeah, awesome. the weather never yeah. changes, man. Yeah. And it's a yeah. good time for, yeah. to get out of the Canadian winter. Yeah. So like Drake's used your music. A lot of people know about that. How does something like that happen? Like for our listeners, it's always like, I always want to get into the minutiae of how these things can roll out. Yeah. So how does that work for you? I mean, I would just say there's so much that goes on behind the scenes with any of those big records you know with with all the producers working on stuff and like um that's kind of the general thing that i would say about how stuff like that happens like like when you say behind the scenes like what, what do you mean like they're just looking for different artists for well like that for instance was um that was just like um i was working with frank dukes and then he was working with boy wanda and then boy wanda was working with drake it was like a whole train of of events and uh yeah i mean I would, I think that, um, like, especially in Toronto, there's tons of producers collaborating. Toronto's like a producer hotbed, you know? It's funny because, uh, I think most people talk about the artists, but the, the, the producers are like, it's crazy how much depth there is in Toronto and a lot of stuff that kind of goes on behind the scenes that people don't even really acknowledge. I mean, Frank Dukes, for instance, it's like, he's one of the biggest producers on the planet, you know? He's killing it and people don't even like uh i don't know people i don't think he i don't like think you're he doesn't get the rec recognition they deserve i guess i mean i guess that's what it is to be a producer though you know like i don't think that i don't think that anybody's like seeking it or anything i just mean it's it's funny because i think toronto actually has like a, a lot more than even people realize right know? there's so much talent there like people talk yeah. about it but you're saying it goes even deeper and yeah it goes more. even deeper like there's a lot of records that people probably don't even realize were made with with you know like this like this circle of of producers in toronto that are just killing it you know yeah so yeah i guess how much like of your time do you want to sort of like when you are deciding what to do or how to divide your time and energy how much do you prefer to be in the studio or on a stage um i definitely like these days i like being in the studio i kind of i mean i'm in like kind of a transition period artistically like i'm just i'm f really trying to figure out a new live thing and kind of just i'm just reevaluating what i what i want to do as a performer and what i want to express as a performer but in the studio i feel like i'm really in a flow right now and so i feel more comfortable but i mean i spend most of my time in the studio compared to on stage i love traveling though um like yeah, so the, the gigging is good because you get to go to the places sort of yeah thing. and also i i've like really honed in on my little portable studio situation. So now um, I feel like I can keep working on the road, which is always a challenge. I feel like every artist is always talking about how it's impossible to get anything done on the road. But I feel like I've sort of made that my focus to try and be able to make the most of my time because, um, you know, I've been, I've been playing a lot of shows over the past year and it's really slowed my, me down as a producer in a way. Sure. So. Uh, I'm trying to make it just work symbiotically and like turn so it to something. Do you fly more or drive around? Mostly traveling? flying. Right. Yeah, mostly flying. So you we don't got mind to drive the, here, the annoyances of the airport, whatnot? Not no, I like it. I got Nexus. Oh, oh okay. blast right through. Nexus changes everything. <laughs> <laughs> For real. Like, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I like air travel is the worst, obviously, but again, I just sort of tried to make it as worthwhile as possible. Like I play uh, video games on the plane. Oh, you yeah. do like the trick where you like figure out a way to get first class every time if you get enough miles. Worth? Um, no. Like I, I, I did fly enough to get um so that I can like uh get in the faster uh, boarding lane or whatever, <laughs> okay. or security yeah, lane, whatever which isn't that much. But no, I, I never fly first class. 
We yeah. got bumped up on the way here. We're not bragging, but it just happened. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. He no charmed Nexus. his way in. I, well, you know, I have my moments. Anyway. You know what I do though? I hit the preferred seats. That's like the cheapest way to get a little bit more room. You know. But that's so. like, it's like by the exit or something. Like exactly. Like, yeah. yeah it's like a regular seat, but it's like fifty bucks more or whatever. I yeah. do that all the time. But that's the way to play it. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty good. I try to even produce on the plane sometimes, but it's like it always. You get off, and then it's like all the frequencies that the plane was making that like. Oh yeah. It's like that's just. Uh, you can hear that in the music, if you know what I mean. Like you can hear uh, the fact that you were listening to that the entire time while you were the energy, that. like what you're creating. <laughs> yeah. is being Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, there's like you know, there's artists that have like super technical training, and there's some like you know who didn't go to school or anything like that. You did some time at Berkeley. I did. Yeah. How did that sort of help you in what you're doing today and what you're trying to achieve? I mean, it's funny because, like, what I studied there it's not the most related to what I'm doing now. You know, I didn't do any production or singing or anything like that. I was basically just, uh, doing like theory and guitar and stuff, but it definitely opened my mind to a whole other way of thinking about music. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that was, that was, I, I spent uh, two years there. Yeah. And yeah, I feel like, um, I feel like I got a lot more confident in just being able to analyze what I'm even doing, you know? I, th I think uh, when I first started playing music, I mean, in a way, it's like this is the most pure, that's, that's like the most pure time when you don't, you don't necessarily know uh, what to, how, how to describe what you're doing in like technical terms. Yeah. And like speak I got that a, language. Yeah, exactly. You know, like theoretical yeah. stuff. And uh, I definitely, um, feel like I have a vocab now where it's a lot easier for me to be like, okay, I'm, I'm repeating myself here or something like that. Yeah. You know, like, uh, mostly just, mostly just, uh, honestly, like basic theory, um, and like harm harmony and stuff like that, you know? Oh, back to basic. And so you found that there was value in that. It didn't feel like, a. I'm, I think I I'm, think some people get caught up in it, you know, and they start making music from a technical perspective where they're thinking about what they're doing before they're even doing it. But I feel like I still, I, I don't access that part of my brain at all when I'm in really creative mode, like I'm just flowing. And then after the fact, I might be able to be like, you know, like, why is this not working or why is this? And then you dig into sort of the math of it exactly. that you've learned. Yeah. I, I'd seen a behind the, or the classic albums with Phil Collins years ago. Yeah. And he doesn't understand, like he doesn't read music or anything, but he would like hear, he'd know what he wanted to do with the horns, say. Yeah. And so he'd draw it out in like dots yeah. for the guys that are trained. Exactly. Yeah. And then they would be able to make sense of what he wanted out of it. Yeah, that's just it. I mean, really learning the vocab of, of uh, music theory, it's not, um, you're not necessarily expanding your musicality or your creativity or anything you're just kind of learning to speak a certain language and be able to um explain yourself better you know yeah man. It's, it's like i i don't think that i don't think that you could learn how to be a dope musician by learning that stuff just you know? to learn it technically doesn't really help you create yeah uh, valuable stuff. yeah but certainly it's like in that case it's like it would probably be helpful if you just kind of learned some uh <laughs> like how to chart the horns or whatever like exactly, that probably just man. make it easier it's not i don't know yeah, I feel like that's a, that's a pretty. I, I hear the, I hear that debate all the time, you know, about about kind of the technical aspects get in the way of the creativity. Yeah, man. But I don't know. I think you can pretty easily just use it as a tool and not let it get in the way. Cool. You know. Well, we're gonna have to let him go to the stage unless you got one more question. Do you have Drake's number in your phone? No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. That is all. I've, yeah, I've never, <laughs> yeah. 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 Have you guys met? No. Nope. Never. Just always. That's interesting. Yeah. Do you get the Drake question a lot? Every interview. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, we should probably zig. You know, everyone else is zagging, but. Well, if you played basketball with Michael Jordan, I'd, I'd want to hear about it, you know? Comparing Drake to Michael Jordan. Yeah. You said that's an apt comparison? Uh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Scotty Pippen? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We don't think about those no terms. Either. I feel like whatever I say, yeah. Not a, <laughs> that's I like a pull it. quote. Yeah, yeah pull yeah, quote. That's know. the one thing. sound bite. Whatever I say, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Thanks so much for your time. Yeah, thank you guys. Welcome to The Desserts. As always, we're here with our friend and pop culture aficionado, Shane Cunningham. Shane, what's good? Well, as you know, uh, you recently uh, kind of tried to hook my wife up with a, uh, a gig. I did? You did. <laughs> I don't Basketball even know. gig? Yeah. Oh, 
with Jules Casting. Yeah, so our friend Jules, uh, who's a casting director, had put out like a, an open casting call for young basketball players. Like, you had to look young. And so I reached out to uh, your cousin-in-law, Jess, and then also you about Alex. And I said, hey, like, they all ball. They look great. Like, they should go out for this thing. Mm-hmm. They could get in a feature film. I wasn't sure if Alex would like to do it. I had a feeling she might because Alex is kind of very up for anything and very enthusiastic and very confident about everything. So I was like, hey, would you want to do this this audition? It's it's for high school students, so you got to look between 16 and 18. So Alex was like, sure. And Alex is 28. But she's like, a, and she's a high school teacher, I should add. She's a high school teacher, <laughs> and she's also a basketball coach. But she's totally down. And I'm like, okay, it's, it's the day after we get back from our PI trip. So perfect. She seems like everything's going to go fine with that. So she's like, okay, it's, it's at 7 o'clock on Wednesday, 7 p.m. Like, do you want to get lo- or, uh, dinner in Toronto? I'm like, sure. So she'll go to the audition, come back, we'll go have dinner. She's like, okay, I'm going to go to Toronto a little early and practice basketball because a component of the audition is that she's to uh, play a little bit. They videotape her playing ball. You have to have legitimate basketball skills. And, you know, my wife is almost better than me at basketball. Yeah, she's a baller. In fact, when I submitted her picture and we did a little video audition to even get her into this audition, I said, she's better than me at basketball. Mm. A little hyperbole, but <laughs> that's, that's what you got to do. Got to get actor. the gig, man. So 5 p.m. on uh, the day of the audition, she's like, I'm here. Come out. I'm like, uh, what do you mean you're here? Like, uh, c- come out. Uh, let, let's go for dinner and then we'll, we'll shoot around. And I'm like, uh, no, I can't. I, I can't. I'm, I'm at work. Like I, I figured you'd go to the audition, take 50 minutes, and we'd, we'd eat after. She's like, I really need you. I'm like, oh man. I'm like I don't want to go to this audition, and <laughs> I don't think going with your husband is good if you're playing a high school student, <laughs> right? Like that's that's not going to help. Your 34 year old husband. Yeah, yeah. And like I don't look young, and this is going to be really awkward for me. But her voice is weird. It's not confident. So I'm like, okay, give me an hour. We're swamped at work. Yeah. So at six, I, co- I come out and she got me a, a little bit of food or whatever. I, co- I come to the car and her face is like beet red. She's like, oh, th- the ball won't pump. She's like, the ball won't pump. And <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? She bought a new basketball, but it came deflated. Yeah. And she bought a little pump for it. But she couldn't figure out how to pump. I'm like, well, did you put the pin in? She's like, yeah, but it wouldn't go in all the way. I'm like, did you wet it? She's like, you got to wet it. I'm like, yeah, you know, you play basketball your whole life. You know, you got to wet the pin. She's like, my dad used to do that. I just thought he liked wetting things. <laughs> I'm like, what? I'm like, give me, give me the pump. I pump up the ball. <laughs> Two seconds it takes to pump up. I just wet it, stick in the pin all the way. To be fair, I didn't know about this wetting thing. But Are you serious? No. Have you ever pumped up your own ball? Yeah, you got you to wet it with your own spit. He no, was getting his balls pumped up by Alex's dad his whole life. <laughs> yeah. John does great work. <laughs> so the ball is pumped. She's starting to feel better. But her face is broken out a little bit. Oh, jeez. But she kind of sees probably good for the role. Yeah, she sees herself in the mirror. (laughs) And she goes, well, the good news is I've broken out in some zits. I'm like, yeah, that is good. Honestly, you look younger. And she's wearing a cute little jersey and little shorts. And she really looks young. Like, really looks young. (laughs) So we go. We we start going to the audition. And we're we're passing the gym. And all of a sudden, there's all these 16-year-olds. Like, Tall 16-year-olds, athletic, look, some beasts. Like, <laughs> these girls look like they're really good at basketball. And Alex starts shaking. She's getting really weird. I'm like, this is not the Alex. I know. She's not like this. She's always super confident. So I don't know what to do. We get out of the car. I'm like, hey, give me your wedding ring. Like, don't wear a wedding ring to a high school audition. Put it in my <laughs> pocket. I ever walk kind of a little bit ahead of me because it's just a weird situation. We walk into the audition and there's all these uh, stage moms with their their kids. <laughs> <laughs> and they're just <laughs> glaring at Alex because Alex is, you know, she's one of the prettier ones. She looks young and they don't like her. And they're really glaring at me like, who's his father? Yeah, yeah exactly. who's his stage dad? <laughs> exactly. And I don't, I don't know what they're thinking of me <laughs> and I don't know how to play this. But uh, so they give Alex a clipboard with a bunch of papers where she fills it as her information. Luckily, they don't ask for her age on the paper. But you just got to fill out, like, your shoe size, your height, your years of basketball experience, whatever. But Alex is trembling. And she's so, she doesn't know what to do. She drops the clipboard on the floor. 
the papers go flying everywhere. Oh, no. And I'm kind of standing there because I don't want to help her because I don't really want to be associated with her. Because <laughs> you cut but, her the audition. But then she, so she puts the papers together. She gets it up to write against the wall and drops it again. Papers go spewing everywhere. And I'm just standing there watching her pick it up again. But people are looking at me, kind of looking at Alex, picking it up. And she's kind of bent over with her butt out. And I'm like, this, I'm going to help her pick it up. I'm like, it's okay. Everything's going to be good. Uh, just fill this out. Sign your name. And Alex goes, I can't sign my name. So she she couldn't sign her name anymore. Like, she was so scared. It was weird. So she grabs it and kind of does this weird thing. Like, okay, doesn't matter about your signature. It's done. And then I see Jules, the casting director. Yeah. I feel so much better seeing her because she we follows with me. Forever. She knows it's my wife. I, totally. Jules gives me a big hug. And then I'm like, perfect. I'll just act like I'm kind of working here. And I, <laughs> I want to see Alex's audition. I want to I want to get into the room that the parents aren't allowed to get into. <laughs> So I'm like, Jules, can I watch her do her little basketball thing? I'm like, she's really good. I'm impressed to see how she's going to like school these girls. She goes, oh, yeah, great. Come with me. Like, you're VIP with me. <laughs> Perfect. So they, they wrangle all the, uh, the young girls. And I'm, I'm getting close. And the girls are going through. Uh, Alex is in a group of four younger girls. And they're talking about each other's ages. <laughs> and there's one girl. And uh, she goes, I'm 20. I'm a little embarrassed. And all the other 16-year-old go girls go, oh, my God, you're 20? <laughs> <laughs> to this girl. And then they look at Alex and they go, you're 16, right? And Alex just <laughs> smiles. She doesn't know what to do. Like, Alex is, like, frozen and smiles. <laughs> Gets out of it, just doesn't say anything. Goes into, <laughs> goes into, dribbles the, away. Goes into the gym. <laughs> and there's a guy there with a camera. He's like, all right, girls, uh, you might be nervous. We're going to start it real easy. You just got to do a layup. And uh, so Jules is like, I'm going to film this for you. This is going to be really uh, cool for you. I'm like, cool. So Alex is first in line. She runs up, almost trips over the ball, takes four steps, <laughs> and chucks it off the backboard, <laughs> and the ball goes almost over to the half-court line. <laughs> I'm like, what is happening? Like, Alex is really good at basketball. I'm like, I swear, Jules, like, that was an anomaly. That <laughs> That was very weird. Classic stage dad. And the, and the, the guy <laughs> filming is like, okay, like she's not going to be in the movie, clearly. <laughs> the other girls go, just get, get in their layup, like perfectly how you should. Then he goes, okay, we're going to have a little scrimmage, girls. Uh, it's like two-on-two -two basketball, okay? We all know how to play. And then so Alex is like, okay, I'm going to play good in this game. But Alex is like overplaying defense, and she's a crazy defender. And a girl trips her. And she falls right on her back. And she kind of is really slow getting up. And the girl just scores a layup on her. Then she tries playing again. And she's really aggressive and kind of trips. Just, it looks bad. And I'm feeling humiliated for her that I brought her out. And it's this huge thing. She was feeling bad about it already. And these other girls aren't nervous at all. They're <laughs> super confident. So they all walk out. And then Alex isn't even like acknowledging me. She's just like so embarrassed. She like puts her head down and walks out. But there's a second component to this also where you have to do a little bit of improv. And so Jules is like, okay, girls, we're going to head down to this area. There's going to be four little rooms. I'm going to give you a little speech on what you're to do. All that sort of stuff. So Jules uh, get, walks down the stairs, go to this corridor where there's four rooms. She goes, all right, ladies, uh, this is a high school movie. It's about high school bullying. But we don't want it to be uh, a Disney film. This is a real thing how high school girls talk so we're gonna get you to do some improv and feel free to say like fuck or slut you know how girls talk and then a 16 year old girl goes i'm not allowed to swear and, <laughs> and, and jules is like that's fine just talk how you would talk and then alex uh because alex is a teacher right so she's these girls are really nervous for the improv part and alex isn't nervous for that for whatever reason so Alex's like no girls this is gonna be really good we're gonna kill it uh just be yourselves we're all just gonna be really natural and they're, they're all like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're like loving Alex all of a sudden. And then this other casting guy walks out who works with Jules. And he actually is the one making the decisions kind of. And he's kind of like a real brazen dude. And he goes over to Jules and he's like, oh, I uh, have a new best worst line of uh, some of the auditions. Saying this in front of all the girls. He's like, uh, I like her, but I don't like her more than my teeth. He goes, what, what was she thinking there? He goes, I'm actually going to call her out on that. Girl walks by, this little girl. And he's like, uh, what were you thinking with that line? Uh, you like her more than you like your teeth. What was that line? And the girl doesn't say anything. She just walks by. He's like, he's kind of laughing. Like he's being that weird level of playful and mean 
sure. in a way that maybe some people don't understand. Anyway, uh, Alex is going into a, another room that this guy is not occupying. I guess there, he has a helper too. And then uh, Alex goes to me, here, catch, and throws me a water bottle from super far away. And it just lands perfectly like inside my arms without me even catching it, just like wedged up by my armpit. Yeah. And everyone's like, whoa. And like really <laughs> impressed by Alex at this point. And then she walks up to me and she goes, why didn't we get that on videotape? <laughs> <laughs> and then the guy, he's like, whoa, uh, that girl seems a little too familiar with you. It's like, how do you know her? And I'm like, uh oh, uh, I don't know what to say because I don't want to tell the guy this is the casting that guy. she's my wife. And by the way, I shaved my mustache recently. Yeah. And one of the main reasons I did it is I felt like I was starting to look a little bit like a creep or like a pedo. Sure. So I, I shave it to just be kind of a, a normal guy. So this is a little bit of my nightmare scenario. Do I say I'm her stepdad? Do I say I'm her dad? <laughs> So I go, um, she's my girlfriend. He goes, what? Sorry? And everyone's kind of looking at me. I go, she's my girlfriend. <laughs> and then he looks at me and glances at my wedding ring, <laughs> which I'm wearing. <laughs> and it's that weird moment where there's like a pause, like kind of like out of a movie or whatever, when you make an awkward comment to a boss. Yeah. He goes, <laughs> yeah, your 16-year-old girlfriend. He gives me a little like playful shot in the, the ribs. Yeah. So... She goes in, and <laughs> w I just end up shooting the shit with this guy. And it turns out he knows a lot of people where we work. Alex comes out of her audition, and apparently she killed it. So now she's all happy, and she wants to give me a kiss. <laughs> she runs up, but I'm still with this guy. So I don't know what to do. If I reject the kiss, it's going to look weirder. Like, so I give her a little kiss, and the guy's like, uh, okay. <laughs> And then I'm like, let's just go, Alex. Let's just go. I'm feeling super awkward. And then she goes, why? Why? And I go, no, let's just go. We'll talk about it in the car. And then she goes to hold my hand as we walk. And I slap her hand away, kind of like the <laughs> Donald Trump. I'm like, no. And so she's kind of like chasing me as I'm walking. She's like, and, she, and Alex is oblivious. She's like, why won't you hold my hand? Why won't you hold my hand? I'm like, we'll talk about it in the car. We'll talk about it in the car. So anyway, that's how it ended. And you're going to get a call back. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> From the police. <laughs> 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 That's it. That's all. That's our episode. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you, Grace Mitchell. Thank you, River Tiber. If you're digging the pod, leave a comment and ratings in iTunes. That, that makes a huge difference. Also, when you tweet about it, uh, when you reach out, it, uh, it, you know we feel great, and it helps uh, spread the word about the about the show. Uh, the artwork is provided by Jenna Gregory. You can find her stuff at jennasdoodles.com. Huge thank you to Tara Paquette for who uh, does all the illustrations, and our whole team uh, that gets this thing out the door every week. Uh, Justin Stockman, Dan Crothers, as always. Uh, you can find us online on Twitter and Instagram at Mike on Much. The Mike on Much podcast is produced by Max Kerman. I am your host, Mike Veerman. See you next week if we don't die on the weekend. <laughs>